when we encroach into the forest, into the jungle, we are getting closer to the wild. That's the wild animals and all that. And if you take a disease like yellow fever, it takes someone who will go into the jungle to get bitten first. And then when he gets it, he comes back into town and then he, he can spread it when mosquitoes bite him and other people who are susceptible. Two, once the habitats of certain organisms are being cleared, what is happening is that the bigger organisms or the bigger animals, not organisms, like the big, yeah, you know, big animals, they are not able to adapt easily to change in their habitat. So they, their populations will tend to decrease over time. But then the rodents who can easily spread certain diseases to us, they can easily enter our kitchens. They adapt easily when it comes to feeding. From eating litter, they can eat from our garbage cans. They can now eat from our, uh, our kitchens as well, like you have in, in Lassa fever, and then increase our risk of getting these diseases. And then finally, for the environmental related risk factors, it's also been theorized that when global warming is occurring, as the, the atmosphere is becoming warmer and warmer, the respiratory rates of, of organisms or of some of these vectors of disease and their reproductive rates actually increases. So that means that we are getting more and more of them available. And once the, the diseases that they are spreading have not been eradicated or eliminated, then they are still very efficient at transmitting these diseases to us. So this is how come some of these rare diseases are becoming more and more common in our world. So now how do we manage all these um, issues or health risks? So the first and the most important is that the law enforcement agencies, the regulatory um, agencies need to do their work to be able to get the small-scale miners licensed and regulated. Once they are regulated, then you can actually watch the effects of their work processes on the environment and then on the health of people. Having mentioned that, it's important to say that Public health has policy and regulation as one of its foremost ways of um, ensuring that we control diseases. However, public health also tries to take a more persuasive approach to encouraging people to, to first know the risks that they are at and then to take the right decisions in social and behavioral change. So the, some of the public health strategies actually aren't at variance with the law enforcement processes. And so the next, the next thing that we would need to do, okay, is to be able to gather more evidence to be able to say that indeed Galamse is causing this or that. So by going into the communities to do some of the primary data collection like of Aite and the rest do, and also very importantly, going back into our health systems data to look at trends over time can help us to be able to understand better how Galamse is really affecting us. And one of the very um, important ways is to get community members buy-in. So getting them to um, assess the situation that they are in and using community scorecards. You can even get the miners themselves to use self-assessment tools to also help us to gather more evidence on the mining problem. The second thing would be to train more health, train healthcare workers. When I say train healthcare workers, I mean that the healthcare workers who are within our communities already, that's the community health officers, the community health nurses, and even the community health volunteers who are not healthcare workers, but then they have a role to play in the healthcare system at the community level need to be empowered, okay, to first understand the risk in the mining towns or the health, the occupational and environmental health risk, and then to be able to profess, um, what do you call it, education and health promotion to the community members. Because they are closer to them, it is easier for them to access the minors and the community members, educate them and encourage them to do the right thing when it comes to protecting themselves from these infectious diseases. Secondly, or thirdly, 
education of the community members, that's the minors, the ex-minors, the family members, and the community members, with various um, and things would, would help them to also be able to appreciate the hazards and the risks that they face. So studies have shown, and Prof. Aite mentioned some, that the knowledge level, you would think that they know, but they actually don't know. So we need to educate them. So we need to educate the community members to adopt safer and more environmentally friendly methods of mining. The health education for them should also focus on risk reduction measures. For even the miners, there are some very simple ways by which they can actually protect themselves. When it comes to the milling of the, the, the ore, for example, we have already established that it's one of the things that releases dust into the atmosphere, leading to silicosis and all that. So a simple thing like wetting the milled ore at where the, the milling has taken place before you carry it off to go and concentrate it, if you need to, or just bring the concentration close to where the, the milling is taking place, it's, it doesn't cost anything, but it can actually help to reduce their health risk greatly. Also, using the personal protective equipment, the face masks, the boots, etc., and then also practicing safe sex with barrier methods also would help to avert some of these risks. And then also educating them on how to practice good personal hygiene, avoiding open defecation. And even the environmental health officers can educate some of these miners and the, the mining communities how to make or produce or how to set up um, pit latrines that are at a safe distance from the communities, also a safe distance from water bodies that will also not contaminate the, the water table underneath. So all this education can help to avert the waterborne and the fecal oral diseases. So to cap it all off, I'll say that the small-scale gold mining is illegal, not just in Ghana, it's illegal uh, mostly in many places around the world. And because it provides employment opportunities and also supports the economies, it may actually be with us for a very long time. So let's find innovative ways to um, educate the community members, show them how they can safely protect themselves and protect their family members and community members from these health risks. I'll say it again, that the community health officers and the community health nurses and the healthcare workers, though they may be at a lower level in the health cadre, actually are the ones that are closest to the minors. So let's use them and educate them and empower them to be able to educate the community members and then help them to adopt safer methods of mining. And then finally, healthcare managers, not finally, healthcare managers, okay, also have the duty to be able to strengthen the surveillance systems at the community level so that where the community health officers and nurses are not able to pick up certain diseases with simple algorithms and even case definitions, they will be able to identify um, the, the certain conditions that need immediate treatment or management. Either they manage or they refer appropriately. And then this is the final. The academics like the University of Ghana um, working together with healthcare managers, working together with partners who provide um, both technical and financial resources are also a better place to be able to provide some evidence-based solutions to mitigate the risk involved or the infectious risk involved in Galamse. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Asari. Let's do it one more time for her. And um, can I at this point invite our chairperson, provost, committee chair, and the resource persons up? And to remind us that this lecture is held in partnership with.
Dan revealed that the heavy metals you talked about, in, in the fish in particular, was more concentrated in the bones, the head, and the scales. And we, it was observed that the smaller the fish, the ratio of the bone to the flesh was such that the, the head metals were more concentrated in the tiny fishes than the very large fishes where most of the heavy metals were concentrating the bones. So we, we observe, it was observed that the bigger the fish, the less concentration in the flesh. The smaller the fish, the more concentration in the fish. So they advised that uh, we, we should concentrate more on the smaller fish. I don't know how we can combine the two. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, I want to ask, this Galancé manners, is it world phenomenon or only in my dear country, Ghana? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Aite and, uh, Professor Aite and Dr. Sari for their beautiful um, presentation. Well, I, I come from one of the villages at um, Wasa Amenfi, where Galamse is a source of livelihood for the people over there. And my question is, how do we get this lecture to them and then the medium of the language so that they could understand, especially related to the infectious diseases and the non-communicable diseases? Thank you very much. So I think we will take these three and then we have another round, if, th if that's okay with our speakers. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So um, the question regarding the fish, the small fish, even, so I'm not aware of this study that looks at the bones, but the, the evidence shows that there is a lot more by mass of mercury in the bigger fish. And the mechanism is that the big fish eat the small fish. So everything, whether the bone or the flesh, is going into <laughs> the big fish. So, so that's what the studies show. And that's why in other countries, they have made a recommendation that at least for pregnant women, they shouldn't eat big fish because there's a lot more of it concentrated in it. They mentioned particularly tuna, mackerel, swordfish. Those tend to have a lot more um, of the mercury. Then, um, is this only a problem in Ghana or worldwide? It is global. I did mention that in, in um, West Africa, we are one of, West Africa is one of the places that releases a lot of mercury. Into the, into the environment. And it's not only in, in Africa. We have it in South America. We have it in Asia. And that's where you have usually galamse or small-scale mining is linked to poor development. You find it in you know, poorly developed countries. Uh, uh, so that, that is something that is not limited to, to our country. Now, the question around how do we communicate to the people in Wasam and Fie? Uh, do you live close to a gold mine? <laughs> the, the issue I raised about risk communication, that's what you are talking about. For those people, I don't think our communication on the podium is what will help them. I think people like that have their own ways of communication and education. And one of them that we, we know is really effective is using folklore, telling stories. And they have their own traditional means of communication. I think that we need to engage uh, other professionals who are involved in storytelling. There's one that I really love. I'm going to mention their name, Lododo Foundation, which is linked with the university. And they have a nice way of bringing developmental issues through storytelling. But there are also a lot of artists who use music, who use art to be able to communicate this. I think that we can use those kinds of mediums to tell them. But we can't do it just doing radio and television. We also have to involve our traditional leaders 
who can then get to uh, people at the grassroots and then can also follow up with enforcement because you can't just tell people and expect that they will change their behaviors. That's what I'll say to that. And also to add to the last question, I think that's one charge that the academics can actually take up in, in terms of implementation research and getting the, the Ghana Health Service or Ministry of Health involved and getting other partners involved to be able to take the communication to the hinterlands and the communities. Thank you. Yes. So we'll take another round. Hello. Um, I say this is a very insightful presentation, but as a woman and a young woman, I am more interested in if you can highlight the direct linkage between galamse and fertility and as well uh, reproductive health. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Can I? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, issues associated with GOAT is actually um, enormous. Um, not only with Galamse, I'm currently involved in a structured gold mine. And um, there are a whole lot of things, you know, physically. And we, do, we did a survey of uh, musculoskeletal uh, injuries associated with gold mining, and it's skyrocketing. Okay, so. Um, what I want to add to the task for all of us as academicians is the issue of physiological adaptation. Whether those people who are doing the job or people who are living around that place have, you know, advantage of physiological adaptation to all these uh, issues. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. My question is uh, a follow-up to the question that they already asked. You can that I'm say and fertility. I want to know in, in your, uh, your field work if Garamsey has increased one, tenured pregnancy, two, birth rates, and also if it also increased um, what you call single, single parents. Because, uh, Professor, you said most of these minors are migrants. Yeah, so if it has also increased uh, single parents. Thank you. More? Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Caleb Dazi. Um, I want to know um, the Galamsi. Is the government really benefiting from it? And if the government is benefiting from it, what is the development initiative that is using it is taking place in the town where Galamsi is? Is there educational hub, vocational technical skills hub? that will be created there for them? Or uh, is it when there's no good, that means the place becomes useless? Yeah. All right, let, let's take the last one here. Yeah. Thank you go. very much. Uh, my name is Samuel Kama, And I would like to find out if there's any evidence uh, on the use of herbal medicine and the contamination of metals. Because I know that in these communities, especially in low and middle income countries, we use herbal medicine. So is there any implications of Galamse and herbal medicine used in Ghana? Thank you. You can take that. I'll take the easy one, then I'll leave the rest for the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the one I want to talk about is the one on the, the government. I'm not government. <laughs> but I think it is very clear that you know, gold mining contributes significantly to our income, as our revenue as a country. And actually, Galamse constitutes about 20 to 30% of the total gold revenues that come in. And actually, over time, that has been increasing. The time that I lived in uh, Tapa for a short time, uh, 19 years ago, maybe DC would, would know more about it. 
the roads were not that great. And I've heard the same for other mining towns, you know. I think what you are expressing is the fact that, at the very least, the place where the mining is happening, there should be proper development. Otherwise, uh, the impact is not only what is happening in the mines and among the miners, but if the town roads are not good, all these big trucks from the mines are blowing dust into people. That's also creating problems. So we are all concerned about it, but I think the point you are making is that we should direct a lot more specific focus on of the mining revenue to the places where mining is occurring. Uh, I don't want to wade into the issue of royalties, but I think there's also royalties that is paid to people uh, who, are, who are custodians of the land. They sh that also should go into development. And I think those who bear the duty should be able to uh, make input into that. I also talk about the migrant issue. Uh, yes, whenever people move, they live temporary lives. And those temporary lives goes with uh, temporary relationships. And that's what leads to some of those uh, teenage pregnancy. Because the minors will be the most eligible bachelors in town. They have money to spend. One of the things I remember from engaging with minors in Kaka is that they are not worried about going to the mine, coming back with a lot of cash and blowing it all today. Because they know that tomorrow they can go back into the pit and bring some more. My brother, is, is that not true? <laughs> you know, so, so then they become people who, are, who have cash and people flock to them. And, and that's part of the reason that leads to spread of uh, diseases related to uh, sexual and behavior, uh, uh, reproductive health. And then also related to teenage pregnancy. Okay, to add on to the, what the single um, ladies should be worried about, you know that the heavy metal poisoning actually affects children, even from in utero. And so we are having more of these kids that are being born with developmental and intellectual disabilities, attention deficits, hyperactive disorders, and other learning disabilities. So that's probably one of the things that you should um, worry about. I think the other questions have been answered already, so we can go on. Uh, mine is a comment, uh, and has to do with, I mean, you mentioned the fertility issue. There is evidence that the nanoparticles of gold actually affect the motility of the sperm. The sperms are not able to move properly when they are exposed to those nanoparticles, and that can affect fertility. Thank you. I also want to thank the speakers for an ex extraordinary uh, meeting. I'm so happy I was able to hear. Uh, but it goes without saying that Mercury's impact on all of us you know, should uh, make us want to stop the use of Mercury. And you did mention that there was an alternative uh, to Mercury. And why is it not being enforced? Because we are all exposed to the level of Mercury and the uh, Mercury and brain function has been clearly established. Thank you. Let's take a few more. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Basim. I'm a student. Yes, so my question is uh, of, to Prof. Aite. Um, listening to you, I enjoyed your presentation very much. Um, you, you, you touched on the sources of the metals, um, mercury, which we all know is external, so they bring it inside through the processes and then, but for the other metals, I want to find out, did your study look at the different sources, maybe looking at the lithogenic side or the anthropogenic where see maybe the farmers will apply pesticides and fertilizers that will introduce these other metals? That's, that's what I want to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, please, in addition to her question, I want to ask how long has um, the use of mercury been, like, I mean, mining has been in Ghana for a while. How long has it been, 
have they used the mercury that there's no government um, regulation on the use of mercury in um, this one and why are we not resorting to the the other one that you don't have to use the mercury probably it looks like a longer um, process but why don't we resort to that one okay thank you very much and thank you for the insightful lecture as my brother mentioned, I also come from a mining community in the north. And one issue is that people are not mining because they just want to mine. It's because of sustainability. And the discussion always focus on the small-scale miners, but there seem to be silence on the large-scale miners who are also causing adverse effects on the land. For example, in my community, we have large-scale companies there working, yet our road has been deteriorated because of them, not because of the local people. They deteriorated the road, yet nothing is done about it, and it's causing health effects. The land, some parts of the land where I school, my school was literally hanging. When you bounce the ball, you could hear the, the you could sound, sense the ground shaking because of the deep mining they are doing, and some of it comes up. So why are we not also focusing on these ones and looking at them? Since these are already companies that are under our books. We know where they are located. We can hold them accountable. What are we doing in terms of their effects on the environment and mitigating these effects? Some of the communities are complaining of the compensations. And because they don't get compensated by the big companies, they are forced to also go and get what is theirs as part of the resources that God has given them. Thank you. Yeah. One. There's also a trend where though the people themselves the community members are aware of the danger posed by mining, but it's imposed on them. There is a recent event in the OT region. The people at, of Akpafo went on demonstration protesting that they want their environment to be left intact. But it appears the government is imposing it on them because of the resources. So I think that the civil society organization, human rights organizations, who also come, go to the aid of the poor community members. They are saying their occupation is famine, and they want it to remain like that. But now you are bringing international organizations with this heavy equipment to come and destroy their livelihood. So it's not that because the people don't have anything to do, but the companies come and destroy their livelihood, so they are left with nothing but to go into Galamse. So sometimes it's not the people who create it, but the uh, uh, mining companies. So they rather uh, what, drive the people into poverty. They don't have any alternative. Then the only alternative is to go into Galamse. So please, when we are projecting it, the blame should first go, uh, go to the mining companies and not the people, because they were doing their farming. And now the people of Akpafu says, yes, we want to remain farmers, not miners. But they are still pushing and going to ensure that they will destroy the beautiful forest that they have. So please, the newsmen here, I think there was a, a documentary that was shown only once. I don't know, you know, this since politics is involved and they will not want to repeat some of the things that will come up. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So our resource persons? Response. It looks like uh, the questions are directed at me. All right. So um, is there an alternative to mercury? Yes. There are other alternatives. For example, the large scale miners one of the main approaches they use is dissolution using cyanide. Um, except that the processes for retrieving with cyanide is not as simple as uh, the ones that are used by uh, the artisanal uh, gold miners. And so the attraction to use uh, mercury is just because it's a simple process. And Perhaps the biggest challenge when it comes to um, mercury is containment and then also safe handling. 
if we are able to deal with that, we may be able to deal with a big part of the problem. But uh, in the foreseeable next you know, future, we are not going to decrease it by just saying, let's not use mercury. That's going to be very challenging, but it's a simple mm -hmm. approach to use. Um, other heavy metal sources. Hello. Yeah, this is better. So other metal sources. You're asking if there are other metals. I think that was... Those are all generated from excavation and then washing into the water bodies or leaving it in the soil. Because these metals, they are all naturally occurring. And they come, there are studies that have shown that the ore that we have in Ghana is associated with arsenic and all these uh, metals. But when we excavate the earth, then we make it more easy for it to then you know, become exposed to people. So that's how we are getting exposed to these other heavy metals. Now, regarding mercury, actually there is regulation on mercury in Ghana. And the problem is enforcement. Because, you know, nobody sets up a shop for uh, Galamse. It's all hidden, like, like we have made the point. It's, it's mostly uh, illegal. And so I have had one occasion in the western region where we're coming from a community we're doing some work in. And we saw young men running early in the morning because the soldiers were coming. And they work at night. And then during the day, they just go into hiding. So it's hard to really track that. The only people who know that this is happening are the community members themselves. And we need to engage the community to be able to solve that. Otherwise, uh, we actually have a regulation that is supposed to deal with this. Somebody mentioned large, the, from the north, large-scale mining. I think we need to clarify that there is artisanal uh, mining, there is small-scale mining, which may involve a lot more people, but large-scale mining is a different animal altogether. And there are few of them. There are not many of them. I have been to large-scale mines for gold, for man uh, uh, manganese, and others. And there, they use heavy equipment, and they have standards and, and procedures in place for containment. What you are describing sounds to me like a larger scale of small-scale mining, right? <laughs> so, so those don't have the kind of protections. That's why your school is being put in that kind of situation, OK? But those. Uh, are the ones that you can actually see them. The problem you are describing is a problem of enforcement. A lot of people get concessions to mine on, but they don't have control over all the concessions. So then other people go in and go and mine. And that's where some of these excesses then happen. You see people mining even in the community where they live in. And there's not much differentiation between where they live and where they work. As for the politics and the externalities, remember, gold has been mined in Ghana for many, many years. And it didn't used to create all these problems that we are facing. It's because the price of gold has been going up. A lot more people have gone in. And now people have thrown caution to the wind. In the past, people actually mined gold to ensure sustainability of their farms. Now it's the other way around. People in Accra are mining, and they are sitting here. And they don't care about their land, because they, they are just there for the money. And that's where it's a different kind of situation we are dealing with together. And so when you talk about the politics, I can imagine that that's where it's coming from. But that's beyond my pay grade, so that's all I'll say. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is James McKeon. And um, just thank you very much for the presentation. How I wish you've given this presentation before today, because I recently submitted my thesis on, <laughs> on this topic. And um, 
just to say that I think we need to separate the discussion. We must separate Galamsi from artisanal mining and small scale mining. We usually put them together so it becomes difficult trying to solve the problem. If I see an excavator, it's not, that's not small scale mining. That's artisanal uh, mining. That is Galamsi. If they don't have the um, permit or regulation to do that. So I think we need to separate that. And to end by saying that one of the studies that um, I looked at mentioned the effect on kidneys and our kidneys. And those of us for the past two days have known that the cost of dialysis has increased in Kolebu, and there's a lot of talk on it. And if you look at the, between the exposed and then unexposed group, the more mercury you have in your body, it increases the chance of getting kidney disease. And it's as high as 87% among the exposed group than the unexposed group. And when you mentioned the fish now, this, it tells me that it's not just a problem of those who are there. So if you think you're in, in Accra and there's no small scale mining around you, you may eat the fish and then get more mercury loaded in you and you can develop kidney disease. So let's say we can protect ourselves in this. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. My name is Notedua. I'm with the Medical School Department of Psychiatry. Thanks for the presentations. Um, let me touch on something which I'm sure Prof. Uh, Aite will say is beyond his pay grade. But is it not strange that we are able to quantify the contribution of Galamse or artisanal mining to our economy? We say they are hidden. We can't find them. They work at night. Their produce is well represented and quantified in our economic data. Is it not strange? Our researchers are able to quantify this. Now, this presentation is about health and environmental impact. I see no reason why economically, academically, clinically, we cannot correlate what we claim to be deriving from this endeavor and map it onto the resources. So for example, a research like this is good, but I'd love it to be tied to, let's say, one district, one factory. In the deprived areas, which of our policies is seeking to locate any of these industries or any of these clear potential sources of alternative livelihood meaningfully? in these zones to address. Then we can start to see, because some of your recommendations talk about alternative livelihood. Call them illegal, call them small scale, they are generating. When you want data, you can calculate how much they make for this country, right? So I'm looking at this disparity. Hidden, illegal, but quantifiable, right? So who's making the money? And I think as academics, we should not shy away from these issues and leave them as very uh, dilute or vague recommendations. I believe if your research finds out or mines data which shows you how much we're getting from it, then we need to have some serious talking. And then we can now start holding those we need to hold feet to the fire. Thank you. Um, I'm Prince De Grant Brempong. I want to ask that how can you protect yourself against the mercury exposure? And also how can the government help Stop illegal mining. Um, that hmm. third question. Uh, um, I want to ask that. Um, uh, okay. Um, it, one last one. Um, it, uh, the mining process in illegal mining. Is it the same as the mining process from other firms? Is there a difference between them? Uh, 
Thank you for your lectures. I just want to ask Prof. Aite that there are several guidelines for fish in pregnancy. Can we use them? I teach my students that when I teach them, even though I didn't know how polluted our waters were, but there are guidelines for reduce, it's taking about two tuna steaks a week or reducing oily fish to twice a week. So can we use the ones they use in the UK and other places? Or we need to reduce it more? Let me start. Hmm. These questions are particularly hard. <laughs> There's a question we missed on herbal medicine. I think, uh, you know, this is general to any question that you answer on herbal medicine. Half of the time, we don't know what is in it. And we don't know what it is doing for us. But we also don't know if there's any evidence showing that uh, that herbal medicine is able to do anything for you on heavy metals. So this one, I cannot say that we know or we don't know. The only thing I can say is that go to an accredited and regulated uh, treatment. And if you use herbal medicine, you use it with all the risks that are associated with it, whether for uh, heavy metals or not. So that's what I would say to that. Now, the question, Nauti, you raised the question about the economics. Actually, you remind me of a paper that was done by a team led by Neil Basu and Provost, you were part of that paper and a number of uh, colleagues actually looking at the economic impact of Galamse and its links to health. So some of that has been done. Of course, it was beyond the purview of this conversation that we are having. And I think there are methods that can be able to There are methods that can be able to quantify it, and I don't think this will be, the, the economist here, I don't think this will be the typical uh, way of quantifying it because a lot of it is not in the mainstream reporting. The people who do Galamsey, they don't report tax. They don't report on how much they are getting. But the thing is that we know the gold that is being sold. So we can have a way of estimating to some extent how much inflows is coming from that. Maybe be, from there, we can be able to know also how it is impacting local economies. And the district assemblies now have business development uh, offices. How do they call them? Is that correct? Business development offices attached to them. They should be involved in this. And we know that recently there's been a, a new government initiative to mainstream small scale or artisanal mining. I think that's where the conversation should be because, in fact, if you look at global recommendations, nobody is saying that you should outlaw small scale mining. All of it is saying there is opportunity there for enhancing incomes. The main challenge has always been how can we have both human and environmental health at the same time as this occurs. So I agree with you. We, we need to be watching Nasi Kanuwehi and link that to our health. So that's what I would say. Now, um, there was a question on mercury, right? I, I didn't write everything, so now it's, it's escaped me. Please, if, if the person can. But there's a question on uh, government, how can government stop illegal mining? Again, that's the kind of question I would say is beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Maybe the VC can talk about that. <laughs> guidelines. You know, recently we've developed the uh, guidelines for the general public. So that's, not, that's different from specific groups who have physiological needs, like you mentioned, for pregnant. But for general uh, population, we need to give guidelines that they can actually follow. So we are not very specific like eat this amount of tuna or, because if they don't have tuna, they will get something else. So usually you would give recommendations for a group of foods, then they choose from that what they would uh, take. The UK or other country ones that you are using, they may have 
varieties that we may not have here. That's where the limitation is. So usually these guidelines need to be locally and contextually appropriate. That's why I'm calling for us to develop our own uh, recommendations that are fit for our context. Um, but in, in the absence of that, you might have to review what you have, but take into consideration what we have said in terms of the contamination with mercury so that that can guide practice. I think I've covered the ones that I have. There's something on mercury. Um, Self-protection, how can he protect? Oh, how can you protect yourself from mercury? Th there are different levels. For minus, the main exposure is not using their hands. So we need to find a way. You know the guy, the video I showed? He says that his hands are calloused from the using the mercury. How, what alternative approaches can we develop for them? With those hands that they are handling mercury, they just go and eat. He says they don't wash their hands, and yet they, so we need to find a way. They also developed an alternative to the metal retorts that I showed, one that is glass. But glass doesn't handle flame very well. So, and then the cost of having to buy that one, they, they usually don't like that. We need to develop alternative approaches for capturing the mercury. And that is something that, again, they will look to us who are in research uh, to be able to develop alternatives for them. Beyond that, we who are citizens should also, like you are saying, the people of Akbafu are really being citizens in demanding. And I think they should continue to demand. And everywhere, in Takwa and every place, because if you don't, well, about one third of that mercury that is being released is being released into the air and it's coming to people, especially those in the immediate environment. And I think people have power and that people power has to be brought to use. Of course, in doing that, there might be backlash, but the people have to stand up. Otherwise, uh, you would face the consequences just because you live there or you are close to that environment. Thank you. Okay, so the question about the small scale and the large scale, there is actually um, a difference between their work processes. So like we mentioned in the presentations, the large scale miners have a lot of capital investment. So they, they are operating huge machinery in, in their work processes. So the occupational and the environmental health risks are not really the same for that and then the, the, the small-scale gold mining. To add to the herbal medicine question, um, I just wanted to point out that herbal medicine has come a long way. And so we have herbal medicine practitioners being integrated into the formal orthodox uh, medicine. So, for example, if you go to Tetekwashi or Dudua Hospital, we have herbal medicine practitioners who are are there so if you want that option you can actually opt for it and then of course you can go and discuss the the heavy metal poisoning with them as well thank you um, we take one? I think. all right so thank you very much all of you for your questions and your contributions um, we wish we could continue um, this uh, but of course time um, is far spent, and we would encourage you to engage our speakers after the, 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 the meeting. Um, but at, in the meantime, I would like to invite our chairperson to give her closing remarks. So shall we welcome our Vice-Chancellor to give us closing remarks. Thank you, John. And uh, I would like to really thank our speakers for really a stimulating evening. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> and so they set the tone, and you have also been a very engaging audience. As the questions and the comments came and uh, people were given experiences or examples from where they were coming from, 
from the Western region, from the North, from Oti region. I was just sitting and wondering whether there is any region currently in Ghana where there is no form of mining. Great, great. <laughs> <laughs> make <laughs> maybe a cry, but not greater a cry, <laughs> because once you add the greater, I'm sure that there are things um, uh, uh, happening there. Uh, but for me, it was interesting to sort of listen, watch, and actually come to terms with the evolution of Kalamse. As, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, I spent a significant amount of my growing up years in, in a mining town, in a mining community. Well, I lived in a mining community that was nice, plush lawns and all of that. But on the other side, as you rightly said, I mean, the amenities in the town, the roads, and they are even worse now. I, I did a trip to Taqua a few months ago, and uh, it was terrible. I mean, the road leading to the place and, and, and all of those. But it was interesting looking at, as I said, the evolution of Kalamse from gather and sell, and really I agree with you, I'm familiar with that, to now illegal mining of all proportions. So as some of you rightly mentioned out, it's not just small scale, but we have illegal mining of various proportions. And sometimes when you sit and listen and you watch, it's, it's almost daunting that this issue is so multifaceted and of various proportions. But I don't think that we can afford to give up. It's an issue that we need to continue to tackle uh, head on. The realities came to the fore as we were speaking that number one, mining is a source of livelihood for us. Whether you like it or not, it's a source of livelihood. It's the kind of uh, mining that we've been talking about this evening. It's uh, unregulated, there's lack of standardization, and even for those that are supposed to be regulated, there's a lack of enforcement. And so it, it's just sort of humongous. But I was glad with the recommendations that I, I mean, between the two of you, the recommendations were really overlapping. I was glad, I was glad particularly for one thing that in the discussion, in the lectures that they gave, and even in the contribution from the audience this evening, I've not heard a talk about a fight on Galamse because I think it's a wrong approach. Fight, the words that, as a, as a language, words are important for me. The words that they use, the communication, we're talking about crisis communication, the vocabulary that we choose, that's very important. If I, I, I'm, I'm there and you tell me you are coming to fight me, what do you think I will do? Of course, I will arm myself, I'll prepare myself for a fight. You know, I'm not going to sit or, or lie and just allow you to come and fight me. So really, I do believe that it's a wrong approach. That's why we've been fighting, you know, Galamse, all these years, but we have not succeeded. Collaboration is what we need. We need to get closer to the community, the community members, and understand, first of all, understand what is going on. You know, we don't go into the community thinking that we know, and we have come with the solutions for them. We need to go appreciate what is going on, and then that forms the basis for education. And really, that is what I would like to see us do more as a university, be an engaged university. And so we don't sit and talk among ourselves and work among ourselves. If we want the work that we're doing to be of benefit to the community, 
we need to work with the community members from day one, even from day zero, <laughs> you know, to get the kinds of results that we need to we need to do. Then we understand them better. We appreciate the language that they speak. We educate them on the basis of what we have developed together, and we help and uh, and and guide them. I I was. Uh, Proprietor, I was amazed at your young man. I, I, I don't know whether it was ignorance or arrogance or a combination <laughs> or a combination of, <coughs> of, 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 of the two. I, I, I was involved in um, a Galamse project. It was a multidisciplinary project with some colleagues from the College of Basic and Applied Sciences and the Humanities, and uh, in collaboration with the University of, of York. And then there was a follow-up project to that, which I wasn't directly involved, but that involved communication in the mining communities. And there were some mining communities in the Eastern region. And this time around, there was collaboration with the School of Performing Arts. And actually, there was a theater performance that was produced out of that. And using the community members. So these, I think that we need more of such if we want to find real solutions to these. We need to thoroughly, thoroughly discuss alternative sources of livelihood. Look, when you're going to take somebody's livelihood from them, it's not a... <laughs> It's, it's not an, an easy matter. So it has to be properly thought through, discussed, and planned. And we need to make other options more attractive. We need to make agriculture attractive. We need to uh, make tourism viable. When I go to other places and see what they've made out of tourism, I mean, there'll be some small stone they will put there. They, they would create a story out of it. And, you know, people will be lining up. I mean, sometimes you see the lines that the queues, the length of the queues uh, going in for some tourist attraction. You go join that queue for two hours. You enter and you're really not even sure what's going on <laughs> there. <laughs> There is so much that we have, and we need to really make the very uh, best of this. This, uh, this lecture and the discussion that followed uh, was uh, nostalgic uh, for me because of uh, uh, my uh, background. But also on, on, on a personal note, I, I grew up with a fear for meat. You know, th there's a story to that. I, I would say that another day. Or maybe when you take me out for lunch somewhere, I'll tell you the story. But I, <laughs> I grew up with a fear for, for meat. And I loved fish. And I loved small fish. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I love small fish. So when you started talking about fish, I was like, you know, this, this guy is going to uh, spoil my pescatarian status. And then you hit on the small fish. Then I, I you know, my heart was at ease. You know, I, you know the reason why I love small fish? I love small fish. I like the fish that I will see the head and the tail, you know, all in that. Then it's fish for me because when it was big and I don't see the head and the tail, it, it feels to me like meat. <laughs> <laughs> so really, I, 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 I'm glad that you, you did uh, end on that note. I can continue to enjoy my small fish. <laughs> At least it's, it's, it's a, a safer option while we uh, work on the, the minimizing the use of uh, mercury, you know, getting into our water bodies and uh, our fishes and uh, so on. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long evening, but I think that it's been an evening uh, worth it. It's been worth my time, and I hope that it has been worth your time too. So once again, uh, before I sit, I would like to uh, congratulate and thank our presenters, uh, Dr. Anita Go Asari, 
thank you so much. You, you took it from different angles, but for me, the lessons were basically the same, and there was a, a convergence. Uh, Prof. Richmond, I take to thank you so much. Uh, you, you, you're looking very fine this evening. I, I, I don't know whether it's because the money has come, as the guy said. <laughs> and so if the money has come, I would like to ask you which money. So on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you also for coming and for being such good sport. The conversation for this evening is ending, but it means that the real work is starting. Don't think that you cannot do anything about this. It is for somebody else to do. It is for the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources or whatever. Yes, he has his part to play, but you and I, let's not feel helpless. We also have our parts to play. Well, this is our country. This is our land. We have no option. We need to do whatever we can do in our personal and collective capacities to make it better. Thank you all and have a good evening. All right. Let's do it one more time for our chairperson. And thank you very much. So this is actually a video about the Wear UG Day, which is coming up this 11th October. Look at how beautiful the place is looking like in front here. So please don't forget to wear your UG at 75. Um, Claude, on the 11th of October. Of course, it's every day, but we want to see this throughout the day on the 11th. All right? All right, sorry. Um, so at this point, we would like to make a presentation to one of, of, of us from the college who is serves for a long time on the planning committee of this uh, public lecture, but also the scientific um, 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 conference committee. And I would invite our college secretary, uh, Mr. Michael Opari Tua, to do the presentation on behalf of the college. Thank you very much. May I invite Mr. John Abugri and Kama to come up once. Mr. Ankama retired at the end of July, and uh, before then, he doesn't look it, but before then, he served on the committee. And we want to use this opportunity to recognize his contributions. May I read a citation? Citation in honor of Mr. John Abugri Ankama. Mr. John Abugri Ankama, you served as a representative of the Finance Office of the College of Health Sciences Scientific Conference Committee from 2020 to 2023. As a member of the committee, you assiduously prepared budgets, made payments to clients, provided necessary financial information and guidance for decision making, gave re regular updates on contributions received, and contributed positively to general discussions during meetings. You were respectful and performed all your assignments on time. You have also been a very good team player and have contributed immensely to the success of subcommittees set up for the public lectures and conferences. 
you were conscientious and also punctual at every meeting. You displayed maturity in all your engagements and had respect for every member of the committee. The University of Ghana College of Health Sciences acknowledges you for your professionalism, outstanding performance, and contributions towards the success story of the committee. In appreciation of your self-led dedication and to the success of the work of the committee, the College of Health Sciences is glad to present this citation to you for your splendid work during your tenure on the Scientific Conference Committee. Well done. Aiko. I will give it up to him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, College Secretary. Um, I would now invite Mrs. MP. In fact, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I'm so grateful <laughs> for this honor. Thank you so much for thanking us. Thank you for thanking us. All right. Um, may I now invite uh, Mrs. MP Ajua Bae to give us the vote of thanks. Shall we welcome MP? Madam Chairperson, Provost of the College of Health Sciences, Chairman of the Organizing Committee of the College of Health Sciences Biennial Public Lecture Series. Permit me to stand on protocols already observed in offering the vote of thanks for this year's program on the theme, Environmental and Health Impact of Galamse, the real cost of that gold. I wish to start by offering gratitude to the almighty God for bringing this day to pass after months of planning and for all the knowledge shared and questions answered here today. We hope this will initiate or rekindle ongoing discussions on mitigating the harmful effects of Galamse. A big thank you to the provost and management of College of Health Sciences for creating an enabling environment for the organization of such an event that comes off every two years. Thank you to members of the organizing committee led by Professor Andrew A.J., who have performed various tasks to ensure the success of this program. Thank you to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Nana Amfo, who prioritized our invitation over all other commitments competing for her time. Madam, thank you for gracing us with your presence. I have another one for 11th October. <laughs> <laughs> to our speakers, Professor Richmond Aiti and Dr. Anita Agoasari, we thank you for accepting mm -hmm. our invitation to speak on the topic of Galamse and its health effects. I also wish to thank our sponsors and media partners, as well as media present, for their support and efforts in keeping the conversation going. Ladies and gentlemen, both here present and, uh, and those joining us online, a big thank you goes to you for taking time off your busy schedules to participate in this program. As we get on with our lives, let us not forget the information we have gained here. As we interact with our various networks, let us be intentional about our personal fight against, well, I'm sorry about the fight, but I, I think I'll, I'll stay with it, <laughs> against Galamse. Let it not be just the media, doctors and scientists talking about the harmful effects of Galamse. We have been armed with knowledge, 
Let us add our individual and collective voices to the conversations on Galamsi in hopes of finding a solution to this problem. Thank you all again, and have a good evening. Thank you very much, MP. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now invite Reverend Professor Kwame Na Sego to give us the closing prayer. Please let's welcome Prof. Sego. <laughs> so the, on the 11th of October, he, he will come back to Accra. Uh, as Madam Chairman was doing her small fish review, I was also thinking about my barracuda, my tuna, my grouper, and tilapia. Praise uh, I've been asked to pray so that you can go home and eat fish. But the media, please. I'm coming to pray, but please, when you are reporting, please report what you heard. Don't add or subtract from it, because Ghanaians want to eat their fish. <laughs> Let us bow down our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for such a good evening where we've spoken about Galamse. We've heard the problems, we've heard the opportunities for us. <laughs> not only to do research, but to help to solve this problem. And we've heard also of solutions that have been proffered. We ask, Lord, that this will not end here, but you show us the way forward so that together we can help redeem our country from this menace of Galamse. We also commit our going home into your hands, that your gracious hand which brought us here will take us safely to our homes and give us a restful night after eating our fish. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a small refreshment to my left for everyone. Please make sure you go there, get something small before you head home. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for coming.